um, um, feel free to do so. We'll send out the recording after we've um, finished up the webinar. So I am really thrilled today to be joined by a couple of colleagues. Um, Pam Ehrenberg is our Director for Accreditation Services here at NAEYC. She is our accreditation guru um, and works with our programs as, as they go through the accreditation process. And we are also joined by Rachel Peoples, who is the Director of Field Experiences at Mississippi College. Um, Rachel, uh, Rachel's program at Mississippi College is the first NACI accredited program in Mississippi, um, and we're really thrilled her program flew through the um, accreditation without any conditions. So we are really um, proud to have Mississippi College um, within our accreditation system, and we've asked her to be uh, part of this webinar to share a little bit about her accreditation journey and talk about um, what accreditation has, has done for her program. So I wanted to just give a little bit of a just sort of big picture overview, um, and then we will um, move into more of the specifics around NAEYC's higher education accreditation system um, and just do sort of a high-level overview of what the process, the accreditation process is. Um, I will say at the outset, for those of you who are coming to NAEYC's annual conference, we will have many sessions on the accreditation system, um, so there will be lots of opportunities there to dig in deeply um, into the different components of the process, um, uh, to dig more deeply into any EYC standards. So um, never fear if you feel that um, you didn't get enough information for this webinar and you're coming to conference, you can come to one of the many sessions um, that we'll have there on the accreditation system. But what I have on the screen um, here is just um, one way to look at the early childhood um, profession ecosystem um, and to look at all the different stakeholders within that. And you'll see um, on the screen, central to this, of course, are young children. Um, and around uh, the young children, you'll see um, the educators themselves, um, the ECE 1, 2, and 3. For those of you who have been tracking power to the profession um, and the decision cycles, you'll know within those decision cycles, three, four, and five, um, that there are recommendations for thinking about levels of early childhood educators. And so ECE 1, 2, and 3 are related to those designations. We have the settings in which our early childhood educators work. We have professional preparation, um, which is us who we're talking about today. And then around, um, around those circles, we have the accountability levers within the profession um, through the professional organizations and governance themselves through the federal government, as well as our state uh, regulatory bodies and agencies. And all of these play a really important role um, in how we advance quality and professional preparation um, and how we hold preparation programs accountable, as well as the individual educators and their um, the early learning settings themselves. And if we look more closely at the professional governance and, gover and the state, um, or federal regulatory bodies, and thinking about the responsibilities um, that each of those holds. Um, you'll see on the left, under the professional governance, that as a profession, we are the ones who set the standards, um, who create and hold ourselves accountable to the code of ethics um, through accreditation, which we'll be talking about today, that in every other profession, it's, it is that profession that sets the standards for accreditation and oversees and operates the accreditation system. Um, Professions also generate uh, the exams and the content for the professional exams and certification and, and oversee the specialized credentials within there. As we move over to the state um, and federal side, you know, it's really their responsibility to make sure that those who are practicing are safe to practice in a way. Um, and they partner with the professional organizations as we think about developing the accountability structures for the individuals as well as um, in terms of professional preparation. Which, which we are talking about today. Um, I'm just, I'm just muting. Um, I'm just hearing a little bit of feedback um, from some of the programs, so I'm just muting um, some of the lines here. Let's see. All right. Um, we've got, and then I wanted to share this too, as we kind of look specifically at professional preparation and all the different ways that. Uh, professional preparation programs are currently held accountable. Um, and you'll see on the left-hand side of this chart, um, we have different categories of pathways, uh, preparation pathways. Um, we look uh, first in that first row is really um, 
what we're calling the early childhood education professional development classes. When we think about all the different pathways, um, we know in our profession um, that states, in fact, have very um, low requirements for entering into the early childhood profession. And so oftentimes, um, for individuals coming into the profession, um, they may need to take just a certain number of hours of classes or professional training um, before they enter in. They are not required to complete a degree um, or a professional training program of around 120 hours. So um, that's one category of the pathway. The next category is the professional training program. And these typically lead to a credential. They don't lead to a degree. Um, there are um, at least around 120 hours, the clock hours, within those programs. And then we move into higher education and we think about the associate degree, um, the baccalaureate and master's degrees that lead to licensure. And then we also have degrees, baccalaureate and graduate degrees um, that don't lead into um, licensure, into um, preparing individuals for roles that require a, a license to practice. And we tried to lay out here the different ways that all these different pathways are currently held accountable um, within the profession. Um, so I will not run through this whole chart. I know no one wants to hear the, the whole chart, but I wanted to highlight um, you, that as we look for those, the um, columns are particularly highlighted in blue. Um, the NACI accreditation, uh, which we'll be talking about today, NACI's recognition, which is a partnership we do um, with CAPE, the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation, where we recognize the um, baccalaureate and graduate programs that prepare early childhood educators for licensure. Um, so it's primarily focused on K3 or, or P3 um, settings. Um, and then also for the CDA Gold, those three program, those three um, accountability levers um, are really driven by the profession. The standards that guide these are standards that are developed by the profession. The system itself is overseen by um, those who are within the profession. Um, so these are not um, these are not run by um, state or um, state or federal entities. And the standards um, for all of those um, those three systems I just highlighted. Um, they apply to everyone who falls into the pathways for which they um, accredit or recognize programs. So the standards are consistent. Um, and then the other area um, in which the standards are consistent but they are not developed by the profession are, is through the federal government and for those programs that are, lead to licensure, um, for early childhood degree programs that lead to licensure. Um, they also report to the federal government uh, through the Higher Education Act of Title II and are held to the same standards. But when we look across for requirements around state program approval, um, those, those requirements change depending on what the state is, um, and those are determined by the state. Likewise, for all of the higher education programs, in addition to um, going through NACI accreditation or recognition or state program approval, every institution has to abide by its own institution's rules for creating programs. And those are requirements that are set by the institution, but they are not specific to early childhood education. So accreditation matters. Um, and looking at that last chart, um, NACI accreditation, it's the only accountability lever right now that um, currently um, is open to all of the higher education pathways that lead to a degree. Um, and accreditation at a global level matters very much. Um, ultimately, it serves as a lever for quality improvement in the programs, and it also serves as a lever for accountability. Um, so as we think about accreditation, it really helps institutions and programs set a framework for continuous improvement and set a framework for them to think about um, how they've designed their program, to think about the effectiveness of the program um, and how it is serving its students. Um, it is also, as accreditation, this is our quality recognition and accountability mechanism. Um, it is set by the profession, as I said, and it's governed by the profession. We'll talk a little bit about, in a minute, about the commission that oversees our accreditation system um, and the peer reviewers within our system, but these are all faculty, our early childhood faculty and others in the profession who serve as volunteers um, in our system and hold programs accountable. Um, and again, this is all leading towards supporting stronger pathways um, for the early childhood workforce. Um, we have a workforce um, in which uh, the credentials are quite varied. Um, as I said, um, the requirements for early childhood for individuals to become early childhood educators 
vary state to state, um, but at the beginning level, there is often a very low threshold in terms of expectations for qualifications and credentials. Oh, you flew out there. Childhood educators. Um, so we, um, so this is one way for us to be able to raise um, the quality of the preparation pathways and to support our workforce um, in moving through these pathways. And I want to turn this over to Rachel um, just to talk a little bit about at more of the programmatic level, what accreditation does, um, and to share a little bit about her uh, accreditation journey with NAEYC. Rachel? Yes, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. We, um, the state of Mississippi has um, placed a renewed interest on early childhood education, and so as a result, we decided to create a new program at our university, and it is called the Early Childhood Care and Development Program. We decided to go through the NAEYC accreditation process because we really wanted to make sure that our program was as effective as it could be, and we really needed um, a set of criteria and guidelines just to make sure we were really doing the best that we could for our students and for our community. We also found that um, just in the past in other areas of our programs, when we go through an accreditation process, it really does give us a formal way to organize what we're doing and to take a very honest look at our programs and to recognize the areas where we're weak, where we need to improve, and where we're doing well. The um, accreditation process really helped us formulate and develop a plan to recruit students. So as far as building a strong pathway from recruitment to completion, this was something that's been very helpful to us. We have um, recruited students from within our university who maybe who had undecided majors and from those outside our university who had an interest in the early childhood field. They, um, very many of them have come to our university because of this program. We also were able to formulate and design and articulate and communicate the process of how our students entered into our program, went through the program, graduated, and how they actually went out into the field and began working. Um, this was just something that was um, kind of a, a something visible to them so that we could show them the pathway that they should follow to be successful in the field. Um, to build and sustain meaningful partnerships has been something that's been so important to us. The partnerships we've developed through all of the different practicums and field experiences that we have has really just enabled our candidates to see a variety of settings, to um, understand the different philosophies of early childhood education. We have developed some very meaningful partnerships with the people in our community and the different centers. We, throughout our program, we give our candidates opportunities to experience programs, early childhood programs in three different elementary schools within three different school districts in our area. We go to Montessori schools. We have our students at at-risk, inner-city, private, and public preschools all throughout our city and the surrounding areas. And we also have some really part of the places that we need to add some additional settings. We um, know we need to incorporate some home centers and a Head Start center. That's not something we're doing right now, but it's something that we know we should do. We wouldn't know that were it not for the accreditation process. It's just made us very clear, made it very clear to us the different areas that we should, where we should give our students experience. Um, we've learned to measure candidate readiness. We have um, developed some really strong assessment instruments by using the guidelines put forth by NAUIC. They have helped us to um, be sure that we're measuring the things that are important. We also have found that our partners out in the community have been very interested in our assessment instruments and start, they're starting to use some of our instruments to even look at their own employees and um, the people who are working in their centers because they recognize our assessments as being high quality and measuring the things that are important to um, the program and to the area. We have used these assessments to measure the impact see where we're doing well, to see where we need to improve. 
Um, that's been something that's helped us a lot. And I don't think we would be nearly where we were with our program had we not gone through the accreditation process. It's certainly rigorous, and it forced us to take some really hard looks at what we were doing and what we were asking our students to do. But it is something that has made our program so much better. Um, we've worked with other universities. We don't currently have a graduate program, but we have worked with other universities who do, and many of our students have transferred from our university to graduate programs at other schools. And so that's something that NAYC has made very easy for us to do because it's a common set of standards that many different universities are looking at. And so it makes that transition very easy. Now, that's about all I had about that. You want to move on to the next slide? Mary? Hello? Mary, can you hear me? Hello? Oh, Rachel, I'm sorry. I might, I was on mute. I'm sorry. That's okay. Great. We are so, um, so moving, here. We are. <laughs> yes, moving on to the next slide. Um, one thing that I could say is that um, we have, I think a lot of people around the area have really recognized that um, we have achieved an important accreditation when we've achieved the NAYC accreditation. We, um, as, as we said earlier, we're the only only university within our state who has gone through this accreditation process. And so it really has designated our, our program as being a high quality program and it's helped with our recruiting. Um, just when people call us, they, a lot of times they will have seen that from the website, the NAUIC website. They've seen that we are an accredited program. We're getting lots of calls from around the country um, about that. We do not have anything online right now and so that's not anything that we can do except for those people who are in our area, but it has really um, helped us. When we started our program also on our campus, it helped us financially within our university when they saw that we were an accredited program. Um, our university has been more willing to give us resources to help pay people to do things um, important to our program um, because we have achieved that recognition. And then it's been nice to put that NAUIC accreditation seal on our website so that people can see it. So we're really proud of it. And it's something that um, has been just a very helpful piece to kind of pull all the things together with our program and help us just to show that we're a high quality program. Great. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, and you know, so there are many, positives and, and benefits to moving through accreditation. I really appreciate you sharing your experience um, at the college going through that process. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge that there are also barriers to accreditation too, um, and that we hear from faculty um, and even within our, that are barriers within our profession as well. So, you know, I also want to acknowledge those too. Um, and, um, you know, as we as we think about accreditation, you know, one of the challenges in our field, our early childhood field, is that um, early childhood is not necessarily a valued field, and that can play out with institutions. Um, we hear often that um, for faculty that want to move through this process and um, helping their presidents and provosts understand uh, the value of early childhood education, um, and that even though it is a low wage field, um, and institutions particularly are feeling a lot of pressure. Um, from um, um, the feds, um, from the states, um, about ensuring that their graduates move into high paying um, and living wage careers. Um, early childhood education remains one of those challenge areas because it is a field uh, that requires um, many skills and complex knowledge for working with young children, um, but the pay certainly does not reflect the complexity of the work. Um, that we do with young children. Um, and that can be a barrier um, in terms of making, making that case for accreditation. 
We are also in our early childhood profession, we, we, are, we differ from others um, in that accreditation for professional preparation or recognition, it's not required of, of professional preparation programs. Whereas you look at other professions, whether it's nursing, law, landscape architecture, um, and accreditation of the professional preparation pathways is a requirement um, that you have to graduate from an accredited system. Um, and so that's you know currently not uh, the 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 situation in the early childhood profession, um, and it does you know accreditation it does cost. Um, it is um, even though um, it is a system that is uh, operated and and is run by um, primarily volunteers, um, the accreditation work um, does does require funds um, in order to operate the system, conduct the site visits. Um, so, you know, that is a piece that can be a barrier for institutions. Um, and we always like to be upfront that it is work um, to go through any accreditation system. Um, but we'll talk in a minute that it's meant to be a rigorous process. It is not meant to be um, a burdensome process to programs. So um, our goal is not to have programs staying up until four in the morning, um, working on their self-study reports. Um, but it is a process that requires work. Um, it's going to require programs, um, as Rachel highlighted, to really look critically at their programs um, and to think about what is the strengths of the programs are and where the gaps are, particularly in relation to um, the standards, the accreditation standards. But all of this is why um, we are leading to the work that we're doing with Power to the Profession. And so I want to say a word about that, and then we're going to move into talking more specifically about the accreditation system itself. Um, but given all of the, you know, the barriers that can sometimes um, be placed in front of institutions and others that, that want to pursue accreditation. Um, this is why the work of Power to the Profession that NAEYC is doing in collaboration with 14 other early childhood organizations to really develop a shared consensus framework for the profession, um, to think about a framework that addresses the career pathways, um, that really comes to consensus about what we need to know and be able to do as early childhood educators. Um, to set qualifications for entry into the profession, um, qualifications for accreditation and how we hold ourselves as professional preparation programs accountable, um, how we hold ourselves as individual early childhood educators accountable, um, and all of this to make a case for um, being a clear, more cohesive profession um, so that we can make that case for um, compensation that reflects the work that we do as early childhood educators, as faculty, in higher education programs. Um, and so the work of accreditation um, is very much a part um, of power to the profession as we think about all of those, the key features and common features in every profession. I won't read through this entire list, um, but you'll see number nine there is that accreditation um, of the professional preparation programs um, is one of those um, key features of, of a program. So I, you know, I did want to highlight this, that the work around um, accreditation is not happening within a silo, but it's very much part um, of every profession, um, and it's very much part of the work that we're doing um, within Power to the Profession for the early childhood profession. Um, so I want to dig a little bit in now into NAEYC's higher education accreditation system itself. Um, and just share a little bit about the profession, the process, um, and, um, to, and the resources that are available around accreditation. Um, we always like to start with what accreditation is not. And so as you look at the cartoon here, um, you can say the notion of accreditation, um, it is not there to point out everything that a program is doing wrong. Um, NACI's higher education accreditation system was very much created to lift up higher education programs to recognize the work that they do um, and preparing high quality educators to recognize them for meeting um, the profession standards um, and NAEYC's uh, professional preparation standards serve as the standards in the accreditation system. So um, the notion um, that accreditation, hopefully, um, and I, I will not make any comments about regional accreditation <laughs> and how that might feel sometimes, but we have designed this accreditation system um, to feel very different um, and to be a very supportive process for programs. Um, our goal is for programs to succeed. Um, we really want programs to be successful in the system. We want them to be able to build on their strengths um, so that they can use that identify the areas that they might need to work on within their program. Um, and so I think we've talked a little 
the, the mission for NAEYC's accreditation system um, is to um, really set that standard of excellence, as I said, to recognize programs that meet our the programs that we're accrediting um, to their graduates of those programs um, and ultimately to the young children and the families that those graduates are serving. Um, this is meant to support the profession, to support our goal as a profession of early childhood educators and ensuring that every young child has access to high quality early learning and care. And we know that early childhood educators are critical to that. Um, and so as professional preparation programs, our responsibility is to make sure that early childhood educators graduate from our programs um, and they know we're not able to do um, all that is expected of early childhood educators and the competencies that they need. So a little bit about just our system. Um, we have um, within our system, um, I, we have a map here of the programs. And approximately 20% of all early childhood associate degree programs are accredited through NAEYC's higher education accreditation system. Um, we have about 240 accredited programs across the country um, in 40 of our states, and our goal is to get to 50 states. Um, and we are really um, fortunate to have a large pool of peer reviewers um, 250 peer reviewers and our commissioners to operate the system um, and that they oversee um, the system um, and make those accreditation decisions. We're also really fortunate um, to last year have received a grant from the Heising Simons Foundation um, to really help us look at the data uh, within our program. Uh, our accreditation system, it was designed and the data in it was, uh, it's collected and reviewed um, and it, to help us make accreditation decisions. Um, but the Heising Simons grant has provided us funding to really think about how we can use the data for research purposes and to really better understand the characteristics of accredited programs. Um, as well as better understand um, how our, our programs are performing in relation to the standards. So I wanted to share with you a little bit of the, the data that we're starting to pull um, from our accreditation system just to you know, better understand who our programs are. Um, and you'll see through here um, in the far left co corner, we, we've looked at our programs and how they deliver their programs and their mode of delivery. Um, and we've found that 80% of our programs um, offer hybrid programs. So courses are offered online as well as face-to-face -face in the programs. And only 7% of our programs um, offer only face-to-face -face, um, uh, courses um, within those programs. In terms of field experiences, and again, this applies, um, the, the vast majority of our programs right now are associate degree programs. Um, they offer, um, on average, around 260 hours of field experience hours within their programs. Um, and the average number of full-time faculty in the programs is three. Now, the median is closer to two or a little less than two faculty, and many of our accredited programs may just have one full-time faculty member as, as well as some part-time faculty supporting those programs. So I want to turn this over now to my colleague, Pam, to talk a little bit more about the system, how it's organized, and to walk us through the, the process of accreditation. Hi, everybody. It's great to see some familiar faces and some new faces um, in the uh, list of people joining us today. So really good to be with everyone. Um, as Mary shared a little bit about the commissioners and peer reviewers uh, who are the volunteers who really are our backbone of the accreditation system, um, I see several peer reviewers actually um, among the folks here today. So I want to especially give a shout out um, for the commitment that you all have demonstrated already. And uh, we'll have some information, I think, at the end in hopes that some others of you, um, whether your programs are currently decided on pursuing accreditation or if you're somewhere else in the pipeline, um, we would really welcome the chance to have more of you consider uh, joining that role. Um, starting kind of from right to left on this slide, it, based on the order of interaction uh, with the system, uh, you are all have already um, met that first level. You've all already interacted with staff. Uh, we are very glad uh, to have you here. Um, we, as we, we see, we, uh, we are a team of five. Um, who work through the operations and implementing the system, um, but it really is the profession itself, the peer reviewers and the commissioners, um, 
who really set the standards of the profession and, and lead the way. So the peer reviewers would be the next group uh, that your program interacts with um, in your journey towards accreditation. These will be the folks who come to your campus uh, to really learn in depth about the context of your program. Um, they'll read the information that you've submitted in advance in your self-study report um, and really uh, help you get to know your program in a way that um, I think probably as we heard a bit from Rachel's experience, um, that really is only possible, I think, with that sort of on-site, in-person experience. Um, the peer reviewers then share their findings with the commission, um, which is the group that, in addition to setting the accreditation standards, is also responsible for making accreditation decisions for individual programs. Uh, so the commissioners, um, also volunteer faculty members, many of them have already been peer reviewers, um, and many of them also from accredited programs. They'll review the findings from the peer review site visit, as well as the self-study materials that your program has submitted, um, and as well as your program's response uh, to the peer reviewer's findings, um, and make the accreditation decision for your program. Um, as Mary shared, this really is a system that is designed with the goal of having everyone succeed. So as much as possible, um, all three of these buckets of individuals, the commissioners, the peer reviewers, the staff, um, we all really want to help support you in this journey. So this should not be seen as <laughs> barriers or um, obstacles toward having this kind of positive decision that we really want to be here to support you everywhere along the way. Um, Great, so we can dig in a little bit to the accreditation process itself, um, but just as a, as a context setting piece, the next 10 slides or so um, typically will take programs anywhere from three to five years <laughs> to accomplish from uh, the deciding point of deciding to pursue accreditation up until receiving that accreditation decision from the commission. Um, the programs can remain in, in the self-study process for up to five years. We'd say on average it's probably about two years or so, um, can be up to five years. Um, and then from the point of submitting the self-study report up through getting that commission decision um, is another year of, of reports and visits and, and things like that. So um, the next 10 slides or so are going to be a real brief <laughs> overview of this process. But um, as Mary mentioned, if you happen to be coming to annual conference next week, and we hope to get to see lots of you in person uh, here in DC, um, you'll have a lot more in-depth opportunities there, as well as we do similar sessions at the Professional Learning Institute, um, which will be in California in June this year. Um, after your program makes the decision to submit the application um, and you're, you're formally entered into our system, we also do lots of free webinars um, where we really go in depth to some of these pieces. So don't feel like you need to absorb everything <laughs> in the next five minutes, but we'll kind of give you a, a brief snapshot. Um, and great, I see there's a note to, to please, please make liberal use of that chat box. Um, we will be popping over there to look for questions and we want to make sure you get the information that is most relevant to you. Um, so this slide with the, the circles and the little arrows um, gives kind of an overview of what pieces come into play in the accreditation process. Um, number one, we always want to make sure that we're starting with your program's unique context. Um, we know that um, all of you in, in different parts of the country, as well as programs that may be located very close to one another, nonetheless have very different contexts in terms of the students who come into your program, the kinds of communities and community needs that you've identified. Um, some of you may have started work on developing a conceptual framework to really articulate your goals and philosophy um, in terms of what it is that your program wants to accomplish in preparing early childhood educators. Um, we like to talk about standards without standardization. So as we consider circle number one and number two together, um, all programs are, as Mary mentioned, um, looking at the same set of national professional standards. And Rachel mentioned as well that, uh, that that's been very helpful in looking um, at transfer and articulation across programs. So we have this common set of professional standards designed by the profession. Um, and that we'll be um, incorporating soon um, all of the work that's gone into the power to the profession as well. But nonetheless, those same standards can play out in terms of very different program contexts. And we want to make always very much at the forefront that accreditation does not mean giving up anything that is unique about your program. That um, I think um, Rachel would agree, <laughs> hopefully, that, um, that you know, your program has definitely had, had a chance to shine in, your ter in terms of your unique mission and values um, while demonstrating excellence also with regard to this shared set of standards. Um, 
as we move into circle number three, um, we look at the learning experiences that take place throughout the program. So we're looking at this shared set of professional standards, but these are not something that are plunked on at the very end of your program that somehow we hope the students have magically absorbed by the time they graduate, that really interwoven throughout everything that you do. I think um, most programs, will find that there is, there is already a lot of alignment. Um, it, the fact that you're, you're engaged enough in the higher education community and the early learning community um, to be here today, there's a, there's a very good chance that many aspects of the standards are already woven into many of the experiences that you're providing for your candidates. So this is really a chance to look systematically across the, the courses and the experiences that your candidates are having within your program. Um, the last two circles on here have the little stars because those are the areas, not, not to say that those are more important than any of the other pieces, but those are pieces that are most easily measured um, and assessed within an accreditation process. So um, as we move into circle number four, we're looking um, within that whole vast array of learning experiences from circle three. Um, some of them are highlighted ultimately as key assessments. Um, where is, it's really your opportunity to evaluate your students in terms of how do you know by the time they leave you um, that they really have mastered the depth and breadth of all the standards. Um, and then circle number five flows right from that, the data that you get. Um, how, how do you know in terms of your program, um, your students' performance in, in each of those standards, and how are you using those data systematically to make program improvements? So we're not going to go in-depth into the standards. Um, we'll flash them up briefly here. Um, <laughs> um, you can get a sense of how familiar many of them um, are already operationalized very much within your programs, and we can go more in-depth. There's also a, a download, 106 pages or something like that, from our website. Um, so you can um, take a look at that in-depth. Um, and as you do that, you'll see that each of the standards has several components in common. Um, each of them begins with an introduction. The standards are broken down into what we call elements, key elements um, that are the individual components within the standard. Um, and each one has a supporting explanation to describe in more depth um, the, the intent, the depth and breadth of, um, of what's captured within that. Um, in addition, the back of that standards publication has a series of rubrics so that you can really get a sense of what, what does it look like then? How do, how do you know that what you've put in place in your program really is going to be evaluating the full depth and breadth of those standards? So with that kind of zoom through the standards, we'll <laughs> um, do a similar kind of zoom up. We're, we're keeping an eye on the chat box in case anyone has questions. We can, we can hop back to the standards. Um, but a, a real quick look at the process associated and um, it, it often comes up as a question, that bit about fees. <laughs> so where, where do those come into play? Um, so the blue box at the top, we really encourage everyone to go ahead and submit that application um, as soon as you know that this is something on the horizon for your program. Um, that really does let you tap into our resources, the webinars, the, the online community, um, the re online resource library that we have so that you don't have to feel like you're going it alone. You know, particularly if you're in a program where you're the only faculty member or if you're in a program where there's no other accredited programs in your state or maybe there's one way across the state 500 miles away, you know, you're not alone regardless. Um, and submitting that application really is the step to, to tap into this accreditation community. Um, as soon as the application is approved, um, the program is said to be entering the self-study phase. Um, so that's when you really begin the self-study work and, and we're here to guide you and support you with that. Um, often that includes implementing changes to your programs, um, you're starting to collect data, starting to put together the materials that um, the third white box is the point where you're submitting the self-study report. Um, we accept self-study reports any time of the year, uh, but we divide them into cohorts uh, based on a March 31st or September 30th submission cycle. And, and that submission cycle will determine then, assuming the report is complete, you would then be preparing for and hosting a site visit in the following semester. So if, you, if you're submitting somehow this March, um, you'd be getting ready for a, a site visit um, the following fall. Um, after the site visit, um, following towards the end of that semester, um, is when you would receive the accreditation decision from the commission. Um, and assuming that it's a positive decision, as we're fully anticipating from all of you, then um, the program would be submitting annual reports um, each year for the next five years. Um, so basically, it's a seven-year accreditation cycle. 
So you've submitted the self-study report, you host a visit, you have five years of annual reports, um, and then in year six, instead of submitting a sixth annual report, that's when you would be submitting a renewal self-study report. Um, and you really get that chance. Really, we take renewal to mean exactly as it sounds and um, to really refresh and self-assess again, um, get ready to host a renewal site visit, um, and then you have your renewal accreditation decision. And um, you can kind of see on there where which, which points the various fees kick in, but um, wanting to highlight that there are no fees in between after, after you submit the application. The program can stay in self-study for up to five years, um, and then the first fee after that isn't due until the point of the self-study report. So um, you can programs can take as long or as little in that self-study phase with, within that five-year period. Great. Um, so um, as the first step with the application for accreditation eligibility, um, we do look at that point at several foundational kinds of eligibility requirements. Um, and the handbook goes into those in more depth, so we're not going to spend too long right now. Um, you'll see that um, some of them are designated as needing to be met at the time of the application. For instance, your program needs to be within a regionally accredited college or university. Um, the second bullet there about the Title II piece, that goes back to one of the early slides where Mary pointed out um, the Higher Education Act has this designation. It is only applicable to baccalaureate and graduate licensure programs. So if, if you're looking at that bullet and you're, it's not making sense and you're not sure where it falls in, just know that if you're in an associate degree program, it doesn't apply at all. Um, if you're in a non-licensure program, it doesn't apply. Uh, it, it's, very, it's very rare, but we just need to go check that at this stage as well. Um, programs need to have at least 18 credit hours of early childhood slash child development coursework. Um, if you're not sure where your program fits in, we can certainly take a look with you um, and, and work, walk through some of your courses. Um, the program needs to include some field experiences. Um, the program has to have graduated at least one individual, though I want to point out that that is one of the eligibility requirements that doesn't actually need to be met until the time of the self-study report submission. So if you're developing a new program and um, you would like the support of the accreditation system because you know that you're go going to be working towards that, um, you can be working towards meeting that eligibility requirement at the same time that you're working towards the self-study requirement. Um, the very last item on there is the one where we have the most questions, so I'm, I'm glancing already at the chat box in case anybody has read ahead. Um, but basically, um, there needs to be at least one full-time faculty member in the program, um, and that person um, who is designated as either the primary or the secondary contact. Um, if, um, if it's an associate degree program, the person needs to have at least a graduate degree of some type in early childhood, child development, child and family studies, um, or a related field. Um, and if it's a baccalaureate or master's degree program, it, it's, just, it's just elevated that that degree needs to be a doctorate rather than a master's degree. Um, the related field piece is where we do have a lot of room for flexibility. Um, which has to do with, um, we recognize that there are not enough early childhood graduate programs out there. And so um, many, many folks have created their own, in a sense, of um, having a graduate degree in a field such as elementary education, reading education, um, various other sorts of things where you are able to document that your particular degree, um, while um, somebody sitting next to you in graduate school might have been working with fourth or fifth graders, you were doing all your field work with kindergartners, first graders, other children in the birth through eight range. So we are glad to work with you, um, walk with you, look at, look at transcripts, whatever um, it may come up if, if you're having questions about meeting that requirement. Uh, let's see, I see there is a question in the chat box about standards for advanced programs. Mm -hmm. um, we do. <laughs> we do. So that's a great question. Um, so <laughs> NAEYC, the, pro the professional preparation standards themselves, um, the physician statement, the professional preparation standards, there is a set of standards for initial programs, so programs preparing beginner, beginning early childhood educators, as well as a set of standards for advanced early childhood educators. Um, within NACI's accreditation system, our higher education, higher education accreditation system, right now we're focused on the initial standards. And so it's really for the programs um, that are preparing individuals for their first experience or early experiences um, in an early learning setting. Um, the other um, 
for those institutions um, that might participate in CAPE, the Council for the Accreditation of um, Educator Preparation, um, we do, through our partnership with them, recognize programs, advanced degree programs, so that could be an opportunity if, if you have an advanced degree program. Great, thank you. Thanks. Um, and I see we have a question back on the previous slide about the faculty eligibility requirements mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so I'm glad that you brought that up because you're right, that is also one that does not need to be met until the time of the self-study report submission. So if, if you happen to be meeting it early, you can document it at the application. But if not, if the same thing applies, come through the process and get that support uh, while you're working towards meeting that by the time of self-study. Great. All right, so we'll keep an eye for more questions, so keep making use of the chat box, but uh, we'll just touch briefly on what goes into the self-study report, um, and this is another example of uh, what we de don't necessarily want the process <laughs> um, to look like. I think as Rachel shared, you know, the, the goal really is that this should be beneficial um, and uh, should feel useful to your program through the reporting process. So the components um, relate a lot to that slide that we had with the circles of uh, what is looked at throughout the accreditation process. Um, it starts with what we call the accreditation criteria, which are really those contextual pieces to describe your program's unique context. Um, it moves into the learning opportunities that your candidates experience throughout their programs um, and into the key assessments where the individual standards are assessed, um, along with the data from those key assessments. Um, it is just, just one round of data that is needed um, in that first time self-study report um, with the goal that we found it really helpful for programs to have experience using the key assessments at least once, um, although knowing that there are programs that come through at different levels with their data, we don't want the data to be scaring anyone off at the time of um, embarking on the self-study, um, and we can we can definitely work through with you questions about well should we should we wait to submit should we go ahead and you know um, and think through those questions together. Um, there's also a section uh, to discuss the field experiences as part of standard seven, um, and we also now have a section um, related to program outcome measures, uh, which may be familiar to some of you uh, through different contexts within your institution. Um, these are basically things like graduation and completion rates that. Uh, we are being required to require of programs um, through our ongoing self-study work with the Council for Higher Education Accreditation. So um, this also should not be an intimidating piece of it, but just more a chance to start some conversations with your institutional research office um, if you, those are not already in place. Great. Um, so um, then basically as we, we saw the, the seven standards early on, um, six of them um, are really met through um, especially those middle two <laughs> lines in here, we, um, you have evidence in the criteria sections, um, and then the learning opportunities, key assessments, and candidate performance data really gives you a chance to look standard by standard at what your program is doing for each of those um, in terms of the opportunities throughout the program as well as then how you're assessing your candidates and using those data um, to improve the program. Uh, the field experience piece um, is specifically on standard seven, uh, which we have uh, been elevating throughout the process and really giving programs a chance to shine, um, knowing that, that that is a strength for, for a lot of programs. So then after the self-study report, um, moving into the site visit, uh, one last cartoon on <laughs> what we hope it's not. Uh, we, we don't want this to feel like going off to battle or <laughs> anything involving swords or, or armor or anything like that. Um, really, as, as we've said all the way through, the, the peer reviewer site visit um, is a positive, supportive experience. The peer reviewers are your peers, um, faculty at similar types of programs, um, as well as other programs around the country who delve in deeply to learn your program's context. Um, they are typically on campus for three days um, in which they really um, will talk to you, your students, your community stakeholders, your administrators, um, to learn about the strengths of your program and to support you in the ongoing continuous improvement that Rachel described uh, so beautifully from your experience. Um, those findings then come to the, uh, back to you as a program so you can respond as well um, as being shared with the commission. And the commission looks across programs um, to make sure that they're issuing consistent accreditation decisions. Um, and really, uh, those, those first two with the checkbox 
are, are the goal, that um, whether your program is accredited with or without conditions following that first visit, um, we see that as, as, as a strength. Those are two possible pathways. So um, if, if the program is accredited with conditions, it just means that within those first two annual reports, there are some areas commonly related to rubric tweaks um, things of that nature that um, those would go back to the commission in order to extend the accreditation period. The fully accredited is a seven-year accreditation cycle. Accredited with conditions means the program is accredited for two years at first, um, and then once those issues are addressed within the first two annual reports, uh, the program is then bumped into the, the regular seven-year accreditation cycle. Great. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> so, um, and again, I just remind you, you can post questions if you want. Um, and um, before we kind of formally pause for questions, I just wanted to highlight a couple of resources within the accreditation system as well. So as we mentioned, um, we'll be at annual conference um, and professional learning institute. So we run a multitude of sessions there. Um, and as Pam talked about, once programs submit their application to begin the accreditation process, they get access to our online resource library. So we have a lot of um, resources in there and guidance um, for programs uh, related to the different aspects of the self-study report um, and how to move, you know, how to address those different areas. So those are available and it's also a way to post questions there to others who are in the accreditation system um, to get guidance from your peers as well. We also offer a lot of webinars throughout the year for programs that are in the accreditation system. Um, and we partner with our affiliates and other state agencies to offer professional development. So we're always happy to be part of others' conferences or should come out to do um, half-day, full-day workshops um, in states just to support programs that might be moving through this process together. Um, and then I also just wanted to highlight, too, that right now there are a few opportunities for some discounts on some of the accreditation fees. Um, as all of you know, NAEYC, we also operated our early learning program accreditation system um, to accredit the early learning settings themselves. And that's one of the ways to um, advance quality in the profession. Um, we know that for many of the institutions, you may have uh, either lab school or child care programs or early learning programs on your campus um, that, are e that are either already NACI accredited. Um, and if you are in one of those institutions and you're moving and you, as the higher education program, decided to pursue accreditation, um, we're offering a $50 discount on the application fee for that. Um, likewise, for institutions that may have child care programs or lab schools, um, and, um, and as well as the higher ed degree programs, um, we're offering joint discounts in both accreditation systems. So um, we'll be sending out information about that opportunity um, to advance um, as partners to move through accreditation together. Um, and then we also have been working with some different states to support cohorts of programs that are moving through that. So and that's been a way for us to be able to um, um, provide some discounts on the accreditation fees when we've had cohorts of programs moving through together. We've been uh, really fortunate to work with some of our affiliates um, and other and some state agencies to support this work um, in states as well. Um, so we have those resources. As Pam said, another great way to learn about the accreditation system is to become a peer reviewer. Um, and this is a way to really see the inside of the system, to be able to go explore other programs um, and to see how they are um, applying the standards and building the standards into their programs. It's uh, been a really helpful way for programs who are um, preparing the self-study reports um, for those faculty to be serve as peer reviewers so that it helps inform the work that they're doing as well. And we have a ton of information on the website as well, so um, at nacy.org slash higher ed. So we are um, really eager to be supportive and to answer questions, so we're happy to take some questions here on the, um, on the webinar. Um, you can either put them in the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself and we can take some questions um, over the phone line as well. So I'll pause for a moment to see if there's any questions right now. Um, All right, so I see we've got a question here um, about um, is accreditation still recognized by CAPE? And so I think this is, this is a great question. So it's a good opportunity for us to clarify that as um, any EYC, 
we operate two quality assurance systems for higher education programs. And so um, one is our longstanding partnership with CAPE, um, where we serve as the Early Childhood Spa or Specialty Professional Association. And so we recognize programs um, in that system um, at the baccalaureate and graduate degree levels that lead to licensure. Um, today, the, today, we've been focused on NACI's higher education accreditation system, which is a separate system, um, and this is, it's a full accreditation system. So, whereas on the CAPE side and the work we do with them, we are just primarily looking at the key assessments. It's an electronic review of programs. There's no site visit involved, and we don't have a commission making decisions, but it's really a, a review of the, the key assessments. Um, as compared to the accreditation system we've been talking about today, which um, is designed um, to be um, structured like a traditional higher education accreditation system. So there's a self-study report, the site visit occurs, and there's a, and a commission decision related to that. Um, great. Look Okay, so we have a question here and it says, does work in higher education um, in an early childhood education setting or research count for the faculty requirement or does there have to be transcripted coursework? So I think this is going back to the faculty eligibility um, requirements that we have. Um, and we, so within the eligibility requirements, we really are looking at the coursework um, that, pro, that the individual has took in their um, master's degree or their doctoral program. But definitely, if you have any questions, we would encourage you to reach out individually. Um, I think you can find email addresses and things on that web address as well. Um, that's something that we can look, look through, through with you mm -hmm. because I think sometimes faculty members are pleasantly surprised when they realize, oh, this class that I took, you know, I did all my research in this, you know, the class was called such and such and it was mm -hmm. in whatever department, but I did my research in an area that related to early childhood mm -hmm. and we're able to, um, to piece some of those pieces together. Mm -hmm. Stunned everyone yeah. in the silence there. <laughs> I think, well, and I see we've also reached the four o'clock hour. So, <laughs> well, good. Well, we are happy to um, take questions. Feel free to reach out to us over email or to call the offices, and we're happy to talk with you about the accreditation system. I um, want to thank you again for being part of this webinar. We hope you will consider beginning the accreditation journey. Um, we're eager to support you in that. For those that are coming to the annual conference, we really look forward to seeing you next week here in Washington, D.C. And, and special thanks to Rachel as well for sharing your program's experience. I think it's really valuable um, for us to be able to hear from your voice um, how well it works for you. And um, thanks I to all the peer reviewers and others that we see on here who are helping to support programs um, in your communities as well. So thank you. We hope you have a good rest of your Thursday afternoon. We'll send out a recording of this and some other resources um, later on today or tomorrow. And all the best um, for a good rest of your Thursday and for a good Friday and weekend coming up. Take care. Thank you so much. This was